everyone and welcome to Let's Talk MLOps. My name is Becky and I'm on a mission to find out the latest trends, challenges and prospects within machine learning and with a particular focus on machine learning operations or MLOps. Throughout this series, I'll be talking to experts within the field who will share their knowledge as well as advice for implementing, monitoring and scaling successful machine learning practices. Hello everyone and welcome. I am super excited to be joined today by the amazing Michael Phelan, who is Data Science and AI Products Director at Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health. Now, I first saw Michael last year when he spoke at the Rework MLOP Summit in London and I'm super honoured uh, to have you joining again today. Michael, thanks so much. No problem. Thanks a million for the uh, opportunity to talk about my favourite subjects. <laughs> It's a good favorite subject to have. Yeah, well, I've been doing it forever. Like all my, like all my um, academic career and working career have all been tangentially somewhere around, you know, either data science or engineering or ML apps. So, you know, it's all one and the same to me. Different sides of the coin. How did you first get interested in it? Then that's a good question. Where did the passion come from? Was there something that set it off? Um, I was always interested in maths, like in secondary school, I was mm -hmm. always interested in maths and I was actually going to do a different course. I was going to do arts and politics in uh, in UCD, but my dad said to me, he goes, you know, you're not great at the reading of the books, you know, you, you're not an avid reader, you know, um, uh, but the maths has come. So then I said, yeah, you're probably right. So then I did a maths degree and said, um, and really enjoyed that. And after that, then I did a master's in management science, which is now business analytics, um, which was really operations research. Um, and then I ended up doing a PhD in supply chain optimization, again, kind of intersection of computer science meets mm. operations research for supply chain. So, you know, for all my, yeah, all my academic career and I've lectured, I lecture in data science as well. Uh, I have in the past and, you know, lecture in data science in UCD in Dublin and in um, Monster Technology, uh, Technological University in Ireland, in Cork. So yeah, I suppose it's an area that I've always been incredibly passionate about, that intersection of, you know, before it was called data science, it was just statistics and operations research and computer science, whereas now we call it data science and now we've subdivided data science and we talk more about ML operations. So, you know, the, as the field matures, it's just subdividing and subdividing into specialist areas. Um, so I would say, you know, the easiest thing to say is yeah, I'm a full stack AI product um, developer from inception, data science research to ML ops engineering, um, including architecture, cloud based. I suppose everything is cloud based today. Um, yeah. So yeah, full stack. OK, awesome. Um, one thing that you did mention to me before was the concept of getting value back from MLOps. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, I suppose most of my career has been in the kind of the pro probably more the research side of it. So, you know, the way I kind of talk about it today is I kind of, you know, it's like two sides of a coin. You have data science, which is research, and then you have engineering, which is production. So you spend a lot of time in research mode, you know, answering the problem, working with business partners to articulate. So they have a question. They say, hey, we want to solve for X. And then you have to articulate their high level question into some sort of a data science hypothesis where you can either answer it or you can't answer it. Then you identify, you know, if you follow the crisp DM model, you identify the data sources, mm -hmm. what features, what models you're going to use, what transformations have to be implied on the, the data sources what data is in, what's out, what features you're going to employ, what parameter settings, and ultimately then give them back something that they can consume. So you've got a data component, a compute component, and a consume component. But a lot of the time from a data science research perspective, most of those ideas sit on a shelf or in a Jupyter notebook, and they just, you know, they don't go anywhere. So there's no value there. There's no value in research that doesn't, you know, migrate into some form of, of production because you know, a lot of data scientists, say, I've solved the problem, I've put it in a Jupyter notebook and say, yeah, but you can't give a Jupyter notebook to anybody. They're not going to be able to get value from your Jupyter notebook. It's me, yeah. to them, it's like, yeah, well, I don't know what that is. So it's most for most business people, it's like, I want to press a red button. I remember a VP saying to me, look, I don't care what you do. I just want to press the red button and get the answer. And say, so, okay, that's fair enough. That, and that's what most people want to do. They want it either on a batch job, scheduled, or, you know, an API where it's, they just press a button and they get the answer. So how you consume the data science is critical. 
And then a lot of data science projects just don't make it beyond research mode because the, the step to take answering a question into something that can be scaled, optimized, is cost effective, and give it to somebody that they can consume it in a, in a way that's reliable. And, and for me, the difference is, so I'll give you two examples. So we're, you know, we're a new ML ops team in Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health. So you see from my background, Kenview. So Kenview is the planned company for the separation of Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health. So in a couple of months time, we'll be, we'll be operating as Kenview, but right now we still operate as Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health. Uh, just so if there's any confusion there. Um, so I'll give you two examples. So we, we had undertaken uh, a redress of a, a redesign of an existing lookalike model. So the lookalike model costs, you know, typical cost would be, you know, let's just say cost X to run it every month. Uh, it wasn't the, the most robust solution. From a data science perspective, it answered the question. So take the box, data science, perfectly good data science. But then, you know, they tried to engineer it as best they could um, to get it to run as a, as a product. And it had issues. From a data science perspective, we haven't changed the output from it. So the impact of the, the solution hasn't changed. It still does the same thing, but we can improve the value of it because now we've got a solid process, a change release plan, and we can run it in you know one sixth of the time, and we can run it for 40% less. So the value there is you're still getting the same output, but it costs 40% less to run it. It's completely sustainable. Uh, it will run in a fraction of the time. So the business now know that it will always run in a day or two days versus before it could run seven to 10 days. They never really knew for, for definite. So the value, if you think about the value equation, value is equal to cost multiplied by some return on investment. Mm -hmm. So while your impact hasn't changed, your costs have dramatically reduced. So your R multiplier has increased. So your value is now more. And another product we looked at, um, Again, it costs, we actually reduce the cost to run it by 90%. So you can imagine the output is the same. Yeah. But the value is dramatically increased because now the cost to run it is dramatically reduced. So, you know, actually the biggest, uh, as I said at the conference, the biggest findings we found there were to optimize that those products was efficient data models on a, a kind of a cluster driven, kind of spark cluster driven uh, environment. So having the right architecture, having the right data models dramatically increases the amount of, or decreases the amount of time it takes to, to run these models. You're not changing the model, but you're just changing how long it takes to run them. So you're, you know, you're, you're, you're significantly reducing your cost space, increasing your value. Impact is the same. So that to me is the both sides of the coin, data science research, answer the question, you know, production engineering, data engineering, ML op engineering is about creating sustainable, you know, cost efficient, optimized products that somebody wants to press the red button, they know when they press the button, they can rely on the output. And these changes or implementations that organizations would have to make to reach this point to get the most value, would you say that would be relatively easy for them to do, or is it a, a quite complicated process? No, I think I think the biggest challenge in in any of these things is people and process. The technology is always the easy part, but we tend to hide behind the technology because, you know, you can put technology looks good in a, in a PowerPoint, and we can obfuscate issues with technology. And I've seen that time and time again. The biggest challenge in any of these things, if you don't have a solid process. And you don't have people aligned to that process, then you're just going to chase your tail. You can throw whatever technology you want at it. Most of the things that we do could be achieved a hundred different ways with a hundred different technologies, and all achieve the same value, low cost. Um, but most most places, what I've seen is it's it's the people and process is always the biggest challenge. Always, always, always. Okay, so would you say is it it's a good place to start? Right, start with the, get the process going. Well, I think do they go for, hand in hand? Again, it depends on the size of the organization. Like if you're yeah. a big multinational tech organization like a Google or a Facebook, you know, you're going to have one even within there, you're probably going to have multiple different views of AI because if you're part of those organizations that are working on a, you know, part of the Google search algorithm, you're going to be very, very focused on you know, the minute level of detail, or if you're working on these LLM models or whatever. If you're in a smaller company, 
then you you don't really have the the benefits of having a data science team and an ML ops team and a software engineering team. You kind of need all in one. So while the while I see data science or you know the area that it was was coined as data science being subdivided into you know you have ML ops now. Like five years ago, you you didn't hire for ML ops. You hired for data science. Fifteen years ago, you didn't hire for data science. You hired someone with maths or statistics or computer science. It's the same people. It's the same skill sets. Uh, you're just refocusing how they they look at it and how they approach it. Some of the consultancy houses will say that you're, the unicorn would now look like somebody that is a data scientist and an engineer in one because mm -hmm. companies can't afford to have. If you have this siloed mentality of I'm data science and I do research and I answer the question and I'm engineering and I'll completely redesign what you gave me because it doesn't stand up and it doesn't scale. That's a very expensive way to deliver AI. You've now got one person answering the question, another person completely deconstructing how they've done it, keeping the essence of the model, but then rebuilding the solution. So you've you kind of that's an expensive way to deliver AI. So some companies are now saying, well, we kind of want somebody that you know can answer the question, but it's got an engineering mindset. So when they build, when they answer the question, they build it for sustainability. They build it for, you know, they've got the right data model in there. They're looking at it through multiple lenses as opposed to just saying, I want to answer this question in a tabular based format and I don't care how long it takes to run it because once it answers the question, that's all I'm interested in. And I don't believe that's the way forward anymore, particularly for smaller companies. They need their SMEs to be data scientists and engineers all rolled into one because they can't afford to have multiple you know, multiple teams looking at it. In bigger companies, depending on what they're looking at, they can probably afford to have dedicated data science specialists, people that even subdivide in, the, in data science, so people that just specialize in neural networks or reinforcement learning, you know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's very different. But I think the key thing I would always say is, you know, what are you trying to answer for? What's your use case? What you know? What questions are you trying to answer for, and what value you, do you think you're going to get from it? Because just having a data scientist in an organization doesn't necessarily assume that you're going to get value from it. Or having an ML engineer or a data engineer doesn't necessarily guarantee you value if you can't articulate what it is you want to achieve. To have these people, how these people are going to gel together to drive value for your organization. What's the question you're trying to answer or what are the many questions you want to answer, but in a systematic way with a standardized process to deliver value? Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, and what you've mentioned there about um, smaller organizations, they'll often look for one person like you said, yeah, maybe a unicorn that has both sides. Um, do you think that's a realistic want from them? Is it possible and realistic to find someone who encompasses fully both of those sides? Do you think, or is it is it kind of looking for a unicorn that maybe doesn't exist? What do you think? No, I think they're I think I think they're there because you you're seeing a lot of people crossing over. So they might have a computer science undergraduate degree or master's degree, and now they're moving into data science because they think it's sexier and more interesting. And you know, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But I think if you propagate the notion of data scientists only answer questions, and you know, like you can answer the you know, you can answer the question in the back of a cigarette packet, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean yeah. it's a particularly well engineered solution or it's even usable. So I think people need to, you know, engineers need to, and if you think of the actual lot of your engineers are coming from a data science background, they're specializing yeah. in engineering. So I give you an example. So I, I have a couple of members of my team in the US and they would, they would identify as engineers, not as data scientists. But when they were given a, when they were given a, a research model, they reconstituted the model with different clustering algorithms and so on and so forth. That's data science. So you can call yourself an engineer, but they knew what to do. They knew how to actually get the, the model running in a sustainable, optimized way. So I think sometimes we like to hang our quotes on titles. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't particularly get caught up on titles. Um, ultimately, for me, it's about can you answer the question? Can you deliver a product? Can you create value? And is it sustainable? And if you can, I think you do need those solid pipeline. Like you're going to have thousands of questions and then you might have hundreds of, for me, data science should be done. You know, data science research should be done in short sprints. You answer questions, but you don't spend forever trying to answer them. Um, and then, you know, even if you pray to that, if you do a hundred MVPs in data science and you pray to that, 20 of those are going to go into production because it's the ones that go into production 
that will deliver value to your business. But to get those 20 in production, you have to do those hundreds of MVPs. So you can't have one without the other. But again, it comes down to, have you got a systematic process driven way to address the questions you believe AI can address in your organization? Because a lot of the time it's not AI they're looking for at all. It could be intelligent automation they're looking for. It could be just standard software engineering they're looking for. And, and these are very valid outputs. But you know, just because someone's gone to a conference and say, we need AI in our business and say, maybe you do. Chances are you're already using it in some kind of a way, using it through your mobile phone or your laptop or whatever. But if you want to have bespoke AI in your business, what are the questions that that bespoke AI is going to answer for you? And how do you, you know, come up with a kind of comprehensive solution to drive value of which AI can be a part of? Sure. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. Um, I think it would be nice as, you know, as a leader yourself within the field, do you have any tips for running MLOps? And it could be MLOps and data science teams, right? It could be a mix or a machine learning team. But do you have any tips um, from a leadership perspective? I think the first thing is we have a, a really simple message. Just be able to communicate a really simple message. Don't talk about technology. Don't even talk about MLOps and data science. You know, you can people generally the people you're solving problems for <clears throat> your engineering solutions for you know may or may not be technical and they're not really interested in it they they, they, might, they like to know that you're using AI you know because they, they want the that. big red button like you said yeah. they just yeah they just you know like if you know someone wants a recommender system they just want to know that if I put in you know if I fill out these fields you can recommend a solution to my customers and that you know X amount of time my customers will action that and I will increase my revenue or I can reduce my you know cost space by why by using by pressing this button and gives me an answer every day so I think the key thing is you know be very very clear about what the question you're answering is um, when you're talking to business partners just be you know don't go into the jargon with them about ML ops and data science they, they don't know the difference you know for me what I, how I would term data science or how I've just termed data science and ML ops. Another person with the same experience as me, uh, with the same background as me, may may disagree. So, uh, that's not how I treat it. So it, I suppose the most important thing is if you identify a need, you know, a simplified process that you can communicate with people to get people to buy into it and then be very, very clear to the teams that are executing on it on you know how they're driving value because the, one of the most demoralizing things I've seen in my career is you you build all these data science models and you answer all these questions and they go nowhere and you may have gotten a certain amount of you know uh, you do get a certain intellectual kick from answering these questions and you know coming up but after a while you get a bit demoralized when you see that they're not going anywhere. they don't drive value for your company they, they're yeah. not being used they're not being part of you know the 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 fabric of the organization and after a while you kind of get fed up with that because you just think like all I'm doing is if I wanted to just do pure research I'd go back to college so I think it is important that you know you have a you clearly articulate your value proposition and how AI or not is going to drive you know that value proposition and just be very 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 simplified messaging um, and you know, very simplified messaging to your external partners and very simplified messaging to your teams delivering. That's quite an interesting point you, you've touched on a couple of times that they may need AI or they actually may not. Do you find that that happens quite often that um, companies and teams assume that they do need to implement more AI when actually they don't in the end? Yeah, so, so I think like something that we've done in Johnson & Johnson um, over the last couple of years, we've invested heavily in the area of intelligent automation. And intelligent automation can mean not, you know, can can encompass lots of different tools. But one of one of the the things that I've locked in on over the last couple of years from intelligent automation is many questions for an organization can be answered, you know. And again, I'm not promoting any products here, but if we just look at the Microsoft Office suite of tools, so you have Power Apps, you have Power Automate, you have Power BI, you have SharePoint, you have OneDrive. So you've got data storage locations, and you've got these tools that automate the processing of data. For most organizations, that will give them a huge bump in what they need to answer the questions. And then you can supercharge your intelligent automation apps using Office 365. So let's say again, just keeping within within Microsoft, but again, you can do this in AWS, you can do this in GCP. We'll say you want to supercharge your, 
your your low code applications with some with small amount of code. So instead of creating models, you're using APIs. So instead of me writing text uh, an analysis models or vision analysis models or voice analysis models, I just use cognitive service APIs or I use, um, I think it's called recognize in, in AWS or the Vertex AI solutions in GCP. So mm -hmm. all of these models have already been developed and all I have to do is consume the API. So I don't need to be a data scientist consuming API, I just need to be software engineer. I just need to be able to know, I send you this information, I get the results back, and what am I going to do with the results? So I can supercharge my low code with a small bit of code. And then in the probably in the 10, 20% of cases, I need to get into, you know, advanced AI where I probably do need a data scientist and some engineers to do some bespoke modeling, machine learning analysis, whatever. But I think most organizations can get a huge amount of kick from those low code solutions and then low code, you know, uh, married to you know, AI APIs, where they're still, they're not developing any models, they're just consuming APIs that are off the shelf from any of the large mm -hmm. cloud providers. And then in the small number of cases, they have to go into bespoke modeling. So I think, again, if you've got a clear, if you clearly articulate what your value proposition is and what you want from AI, you can get a huge amount from AI, whatever happened to have a data scientist in your organization, because mm -hmm. you can just consume the AI that's been provided by vendors. Already, wow, that's super interesting. That's I hadn't heard much about that before, but that, I'm sure that's a really important thing for companies to look at. You know, what do we think actually your phone. need? Yeah, think your phone. So you talk to your phone, mm -hmm. you get, you know, your phone recognizes your face, it recognizes your fingerprint. That's, a, that's all AI. Did you have to develop those custom AI models? No, you're just consuming AI models that have been created, you know, as part of your phone. So. I think most companies can consume a huge amount of AI technology without ever having to actually develop any custom AI models. And without needing to, they yeah. might not need to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you, you talked about smaller companies earlier on. So I think smaller companies, there is a trajectory there where you can talk about low code solutions, then kind of low code into AP, consuming AI models via API, and then it's a maturity curve. And then as you become more mature and you recognize, so I give an example, another example. So developed a model whereby you could classify emails in an email box. So all the emails came into a shared service mailbox and then using a machine learning model, it automatically classified them. The majority of the code that was written for that was maybe 10, 20 lines of code. Because what it was, most of the code was actually used was to the, um, integrate with the Office 365 system, which is not, that's not data science at all. That's mm -hmm. pure software engineering, and then 10 lines of data science code, but actually you could replace those 10 lines of data science code by just consuming auto machine learning services. Okay. So it's, it's how you structure it. Yeah, you know, yeah, if yeah. you think about, like, if you, if you imagine, if you said to someone, hey, you know, create a folder in your email box and create three subfolders there, and then put all the samples. So we'll say you wanted to classify emails with three class, you know, uh, three class classification. You say, well, create a folder, put in three examples into three subfolders. Those three subfolders become your classes. And then we'll just send it to an automated email. We, we'll do some APIs to do the text, uh, you know, text extraction. And then we'll do auto ML to create a model. So using very, very little code and very little data science know-how, you know, you can achieve a huge amount with low code, small amount of code, and then, you know, maybe build up your, mm -hmm. you know, build up your organization then to say, now we're ready for more advanced bespoke custom models. Awesome. Thank you for explaining that. That's really interesting. Um, I think a really nice question to end on, um, because we're nearly at the end of our time, would be, I think it would just be great to know what do you think is the most exciting thing happening within AI right now? And it can be related to MLOps or not. It doesn't have to be. What's exciting you at the minute within the space? Um, I suppose everyone's talking about the chat GPT now at the oh, moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, for me, the most exciting thing is you've all of this stuff and it's all open, it's all available. It's all available. Yeah. Again, you can consume ChatGPT through APIs. You don't have to develop anything. So there's a massive amount of pre-trained models out there that you can just consume. And it's about companies saying, well, what is it we want to achieve 
and how can we how can we just you know use all of these different available low code solutions to join them all together to create an output that drives value for our organization and again it always comes back to me the technology is there it's never been cheaper uh, or easier to do you know what we now call data science if you think about it like you, you can spin up a cloud in the morning relatively cheap if you know what you're doing uh, you're not just storing data for the sake of it you can consume all of these apis so you can create really complex pipelines to drive value for your organization with very very limited data science um, experience so i think it's for me it comes back to again the value conversations all the stuff is there and it's been there for a long time like if you look at image recognition you know Going back, I remember I was at a Gartner conference years ago, and I think in 2014, Microsoft or somebody, Google, had developed an AI model that could recognize images better than humans at that point. So now we're, we look at text and chat GPTs, you know, all of the stuff is there. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to join it together? How are you going to create value for your organization to answer all those questions that are there using the right tool at the right time so chat gpt can that be used in organizations of course it can it can it can dramatically reduce a lot of the you know a lot of the legwork required for you know i think jim swanson the cio of j and j you know i fully agree with when he talks about it's you know human centric ai the intersection of humans and all of these ai you know tools and technologies that's that's where the benefits come. AI isn't going to solve it on its own. It needs the human to, you know, tell it what problem we're trying to solve and where, where is the value here, and try and mitigate the amount of coding that's required to do it. But it's that intersection of humans and AI. I think that's where the the value for companies is. And again, I think yeah, it it comes back across all these different questions and uh, subsections and areas to finding the value kind of, you know, that's what I'm hearing a lot, which which makes sense because that doesn't necessarily have to be monetarily. It can be just finding the general value, you know, yeah. sort of like, you know, yes, chat GBT is great and generative AI is great. But how can you find specific value for your team, right? Or for your for your yeah. company? So value is key kind well, of. Companies that's... always, I remember years ago, you know, it was it was we need blockchain. And now it's we need chat GPT and thinking, well, why did you why did you need blockchain? And why do you need chat GPT? I'm not saying you don't need them, but people like yeah. to put the technology before the question it's because it looks good why. in the PowerPoint yeah. and it's easier to sell. Yeah. Whereas to actually clearly articulate what the question you're trying to answer is and have you got a process and have people you know, the process people part of it. That's that's the hard part. So we tend to hide behind the technology because it's sexy and looks good. Yeah. Um but we're not really we're still not addressing the fundamental issue. What's the question you're trying to answer and what's the value you're going to get from answering it? Yeah, that makes sense. Value is key, everyone. <laughs> question it, find out what the value is. Awesome. Um, we have to end there, I'm afraid. I would love to keep talking about it. Super, super interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for no problem, sharing my pleasure. your thoughts, your definitions, your journey. Thank you. The same to everyone watching as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Michael and hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Let's end with a little bit about Logic. At Logic, we recruit specifically within the machine learning engineering and research fields in the UK, Canada and the US. We pride ourselves on our innovative community led approach and having a deep knowledge and understanding of the roles that we recruit for. That's one of the reasons why I've started this podcast. If you're looking for your next professional challenge, or on the other hand, you might be an organisation looking to expand your machine learning team, then please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. Alternatively, you can send me an email to becky at logic.com. Let's set up a call for a chat or we can meet in person for a coffee.